Hello again and welcome now to topic two which is on managing chemical processes. We're going to start off with subtopic 2.1 which is on rates of reactions and I'll be going through this in a couple of videos. Our first understanding is the rates of a reaction at different times can be compared by considering the slope of a graph of quantity or concentration of reactant or product against time. You will need to be able to draw and interpret graphs representing changes in quantities or concentration of reactants or products against time. The rate of a reaction essentially measures a change in the quantity of a substance. So that could be a change in a reactant or product in a given time. In terms of quantities, we could be looking at measuring its mass, the number of moles, or even its concentration. We can define a simple formula for reaction rate. So the reaction rate is equal to the change in the amount of a substance, which could be mass, moles, or concentration, in a given amount of time or per unit of time. This time can be measured in things like seconds, minutes, hours. When we look at graphing a change in the amount of a substance over time, in this case, we're looking at a change in the amount of a reactant. So we could start off with a specific amount here. That could be concentration, mass, or moles. We can see that the shape of the graph is a curve. We can see that it actually decreases quite steeply here, and then it starts to level out or plateau. If we were to look at a graph of how a product changes over time, then we would expect that it to look kind of like the inverse or the opposite. So here we've got in red a graph of what might be the change in the amount of product over time. One thing that doesn't factor is how much product forms with respect to how much reactant is being used up. What will actually determine that are the mole ratios, which is based on the balanced chemical equation. A graph of the concentration or mass or moles of a substance over time can actually be used to measure the reaction rate at any particular given time. So here we've got a range of different times here. To work out the rate of the reaction at each of these times, what we could look at is drawing what we call a, a tangent to the curve. So we can see a range of tangents drawn here. And we then need to be able to find two particular points, perhaps where these lines would intercept the x and y axis. And from this, we could calculate its slope. This slope would represent what its reaction rate is at that particular time. Of particular note is the fact that we can see that between rates 1 to rate 5, that the rate actually decreases over time. And I want you to have a think about why that might be the case. We'll talk about that in class. Another way in which we can measure the rate of a reaction is by taking two points within our graph. So say we take this point here, which corresponds to a time of T1, and one here of T2. And if we just connect these points on the graph together, what we can find is we construct the slope. From this, we could calculate the slope, uh, and this would actually work out the average rate between time one and time two. To calculate the rate, it essentially represents the change in the quantity of our substance, which could be our reactant, over a change in time, so between T1 and T2. We could define that as a change in the value of Y over the change in X. Another way of representing that is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. This would be given that we've got the coordinates of these two points. There are actually other ways in which we can measure the reaction rate. We can observe reaction rate by a change in pH, color intensity of a solution, volume or pressure of a gas. This is a fairly common reaction that you see in high school. This is the reaction between sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid. When you mix the two together, which are both colorless liquids, give it a swirl, you put it on a tile with a cross, and over time, the formation of a product, which is sulfur, will result in the cross becoming invisible 
when looking through your conical flask. So we could essentially measure the time taken for the cross to disappear, and this would be an indication of the rate of reaction. If we were looking at measuring the amount of gas that's being produced, in this case we've got uh, possibly a reaction between a metal and an acid. We've got a stopper over our flask here, and with our stopper we've also got a tube that leads to a gas syringe. The reaction between a metal and an acid will produce hydrogen gas, and the hydrogen gas evolved will actually push this syringe out so we can measure how many mils of hydrogen gas would be evolved in a given amount of time. The second science understanding we're going to look at is energy profile diagrams can be used to represent the relative enthalpies of reactants and products, the activation energy and the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction. You need to know how to draw and interpret energy profile diagrams and you guys might remember us doing this last year. So energy profile diagrams are used to show the change in energy or enthalpy of reactants and products as a chemical reaction progresses. We can define enthalpy as the heat or energy content of a system that occurs at constant pressure and volume. It's important to note that this energy is stored within chemical bonds of reactants and products. When we look at breaking chemical bonds, this process requires energy, whereas the making of new chemical bonds releases energy because it helps stabilize the atoms that we've broken apart. This here represents the starting point of an energy profile diagram. And what it looks at is comparing the energy or the enthalpy of our reactants and products. We can see here that the energy of the reactants is higher than the energy of the products so that when the reactants change into the products, we are going to end up with an overall or a net release of energy. And this occurs in an exothermic reaction. In contrast, we could look at a case where the energy of the reactants is actually lower than the products. Because as such, we need to put in energy into this system to convert reactants into products. And this absorption and this need for energy is what we classify as an endothermic reaction. This diagram better represents an energy profile diagram. We have to factor in that in order for reactants to form products, it's not a matter of simply adding the difference in energy between reactants or products or uh, releasing the energy difference between reactants and products. You often require an initial input of energy to get the reaction going, and this is what we call the activation energy. It's the minimum energy required for reactants to collide and form products. Once we overcome this activation energy or this barrier, this allows then the reactants to form new bonds, and when it forms new bonds, it will release a bit of energy and then go to form your products. This is an example of an endothermic reaction Reactants are lower in energy than products, so we could say that the enthalpy change, or delta H, is given a positive value. And that could be determined by comparing the difference between products minus reactants. Here is a specific example. So this is the reaction between carbon dioxide and nitric oxide, which can go to produce carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. This would be an endothermic process because we can see firstly, not only do we need an initial input of 85 kilojoules per mole, so this is our activation energy. When it uh, reaches this activation energy, we can get a bit of release of energy, but overall we can see that there is more energy in the products than the reactants. So overall we would need 50 kilojoules per mole of energy to convert our reactants into our products, making this an endothermic reaction. In contrast, we've got our exothermic reaction here, but we can also see that exothermic reactions often need an activation energy, need this initial energy to drive the reaction so that the reactants and the bonds within them are broken, and then new bonds can be formed when they go to form the products we can see products are lower in energy than reactants, and we can associate that 
with a negative delta H value. We could essentially look at the reverse reaction of the previous example, and we would know that the, the reverse reaction would end up being exothermic. So we can see that we still need activation energy to drive the reaction. This corresponds to an energy of 35 kilojoules per mole, given that our reactants have a, a relative energy of zero. And as it converts into the products, we end up releasing 50 kilojoules of energy per mole of reactants. So this would result in a negative delta H value for an exothermic reaction. That concludes part one of subtopic 2.1. I'll see you guys in the next video.